got almost a foot of snow. So quite a bit of snow um, and very early too. <laughs> so most people who are coming to this part of the country are going to come see Mount Rushmore. Um, this is a place that is also protected by the National Park Service and it's considered a memorial. So people who are driving are probably gonna see this. So this, is, this region is known as the Black Hills and it's because of those ponderosa pine trees makes those hills look black uh, or like they're in shadow. So you can see the granite peaks, the ponderosa pines. Here at Wing Cave, we're actually on the edge of that. So we do protect one of the last intact mixed grass prairies. So what do all those words mean? Uh, so we protect an area so this part of the country, as well as in from Canada, all the way ranging down to Mexico, is known as the Great Plains. So it's a semi-arid environment. It has, um, it's pretty flat, and it can have some pretty extreme weather fluctuations, uh, like 103 on Saturday and snow today. But it can also have some pretty fierce wind, and it looks like it's a giant grass bed, right? So I'm gonna show you this picture of the prairie again. Doesn't look like there's a whole lot there, but this is actually a very biodiverse. So it has a lot of different species of animals and plants that the prairie protects. So that's what we're gonna explore a little bit today. <clears throat> so this is a pretty typical prairie summer. Uh, it's the grasses look a little brown, kind of like they're dead, but they're not. Um, again, the prairie is going to be adapted to some of these harsh, uh, harsh weather fluctuations, and also um, some of that extreme weather that we are gonna have, just like storms. So without warning, we can get storms pretty quickly out on the prairie. Um, so we can not have any rain for a month and we can dump two inches uh, pretty quick. So the plants need a way to adapt to that so that they can actually survive long periods with no water, but then absorb all of that water when they get it. So most storms that produce uh, or that come through the prairie are gonna produce these really pretty rainbows, partially because there's not a whole lot blocking their view. Now I'm blocking the view of the picture. There we go. So the Wind Cave National Park protects three distinct ecosystems. So we protect a ponderosa pine forest. It's where we're gonna find some of our um, bigger species of wildlife like elk, and I'll show you pictures of that later, and deer. Um, we protect the prairie, so those grasslands where we have animals like bison and prairie dogs. Um, and then we protect what we call an ecotone. So an ecotone is where two distinct ecosystems, so ponderosa pine forest and prairie, are going to meet. So it's going to be that transitional zone. So this is an example of what that could look like. And like I mentioned, our grasses have to be well adapted to some of that harsh environment. So if you look at this photo, the person per scale is going to be six feet tall. Okay. The person over here. Now, most of our grasses that are found out on the prairie, and there's a lot of species. Again, biodiverse means a whole lot of species of plant and wildlife found in an area. So Buffalo grass, for example, is only about four inches tall, but look at how deep their roots go. It goes to almost five feet. Same thing with blue grandma grass. Goes, whoa, almost to seven feet. I'm sorry, I don't know metric system. So these grasses, what that's doing, those roots are going to hold nutrients for the winter. So they're gonna be able to winter over but it's also going to be able to store water. So when we have a drought or we, because again, we're a semi-arid climate, we don't get a whole lot of precipitation. So that's gonna store the water for those plants on the surface. So most of the grasses that we see out on the prairie, most of that plant is actually underground. So again, let's look at this photo. Most of those plants are gonna be further underground. That's also important because it's gonna hold the soil in place um, so very important for this ecosystem. So what do some of these grasses look like? So this is big blue stem. This is actually taller than I am. I'm only five feet tall. This is about six feet tall. So their root system is gonna go to 
over 12, about 12 feet down. So twice the amount of the plant. We also have little blue stem. This is probably what you're gonna see on the prairie today. Um, turns red in the fall. It's called little blue stem because in the summer it does have a blue hue. So the prairie, I showed you the prairie in the summer. Here's a reminder, prairie in the summer. And here's a really good picture of prairie in the winter. So you can kind of see some snow there. There's not a whole lot of difference because that grass is going to stay there. It's going to hold everything in place. And again, it's adapted to that harsh environment. So it kind of goes into a dormant stage where the nutrients are being held in those root systems for the spring for it to come out and be green. This is buffalo grass. And here's a personal favorite of mine. So this is called prickly pear. So it is very well adapted to the prairie and also produces a fruit. So that red area on that plant, um, those spikes are very sharp, but this plant also has little tiny hairs on it that if it didn't have the spikes and you try to pick it up, gets all in your hand. My brother-in-law experienced this firsthand. He didn't realize those little hairs were on that plant. So pretty well adapted to make sure people aren't trying to um, hurt that plant. So biodiversity also has, so it's not just about the plants and animals, it's about the relationships between those two. So this plant's called a yucca plant. But the cool thing about the yucca plant is that there's something called a yucca moth. So this is a yucca moth on the yucca flower, and it's something called a symbiotic relationship. That means the yucca plant and the yucca moth work together, that if one of those disappeared, both species would be gone because the yucca moth is actually pollinating the yucca plant. So they're working together. Symbiotic relationship means they're working together. So I want you to look at this. This is a typical summer scene on the prairie and take a listen. Can you guys give me a thumbs up if you can hear it? Yes, yes. You can't hear it? Okay, yes. Yeah. Uh, can I interrupt you for sure. a minute? Yes. Uh, in the last in the last week, we have learned about uh, different kinds of uh, grassy lands uh, mm -hmm. in uh, natural places throughout the world. Awesome. And there were steppes and prairies and downs from Australia like this. And this is uh, about a uh, prairie, so it is very fruitful to my students. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And if you guys have questions, if it's easier in the chat function, feel free yeah. to just put those in there. Um, and I will try my best to answer them, OK? OK. So the biodiversity isn't just about the plants that we find on the prairie. It's also about the animals. So if you look at this photo again, I apparently have a lot of snowy photos <laughs> in this uh, yeah. program. But we see something, it's this little animal, it's called a prairie dog. And they're my favorite. See them here, see one here. Also see them all the way back here. All these different darker areas, those are gonna be what we call prairie dog mounds. And this makes up the prairie dog town. So prairie dogs are a little rodent and they work together to keep each other safe. So when you're out on the prairie or you're driving through the prairie, this might be something you see. Wow, wow. So this prairie dog, and you can hear the chirp, this prairie dog is on alert. So they actually literally watch each other's back, which is pretty cool. So they work together as a family unit, as a community, to make sure that they're keeping each other safe. They don't hibernate. So all summer you're going to see them collecting a bunch of grass. Um, their um, burrows. Pardon, pardon. Hmm? No, no, no. I'm telling oh. her. So their burrows. You can see these two prairie dogs are on alert. They're probably looking for a predator. Um, their burrows are just like most of our homes. They're going to have an area like a kitchen or where they pre prepare food. They're going to have an area where they sleep. 
we're going to have an area where they go to the bathroom. It's the same thing for the prairie dog burrow. So they're going to collect a lot of food because in the winter, while they're still awake, there's not necessarily a whole lot of food available for them. Means we can keep these dogs. You can keep them? These dogs, prairie dogs. Prairie dogs? Um, I don't think they can be pets. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I, I, well, I haven't tried. I've tried floating that idea to the park and they're not a fan. Um, they're wild animals and honestly, are, around here, um, there's differing opinions on them because they are challenging. So we have a lot of ranches. So a lot of our neighbors uh, to the park raise cattle and prairie dogs with the burrows, cattle can break their legs. Um, and so ranchers don't really like prairie dogs. Um, I personally, as a park ranger in the park, very much enjoy prairie dogs. Um, but more important than me thinking they're really cute and fuzzy, and they are, these are the babies. <laughs> prairie dogs at Wayne Cave National Park are what we call a keystone species. So while they're really cute and they're really fun to watch um, with their interactions, again, they, they interact like a community, like a family, they're keystone species. So that means that our plants, so all those grasses that I showed you, and all of our other wildlife in the park are very dependent on this very small animal. They're about this big, so it's pretty small. So we have to, as park managers, so the National Park Service works on preservation and conservation. So part of conservation is trying to make sure that an area is as balanced in its natural habitat as possible. Well, because humans came in, there are certain things that we spread, like different insects sometimes, um, and there's just different challenges. So the park managers try really hard to keep these different animals safe. Uh, this is one of our park resource managers, and she is actually spraying or dusting a prairie dog burrow for a tiny flea because that can infect them. Um, again, if the prairie dog population disappears, just like that yucca moth, there's other plants and animals that are going to be affected. So let's see what that might mean. So I have a drawing here, and it shows a prairie dog burrow. But the longer you look, the more you see. So there's a lot of different animals that you can see in this uh, illustration. And we like to refer to the prairie dog as one of three things. They're, they're either the gardener, so with the digging of their burrows, because they're always digging, they're actually digging up dormant seeds, so seeds that are just in the soil, and they're going to allow those grasses to grow. So they're the gardener, okay? So for animals like the bison, for the pronghorn, where grass is really important, that's their entire diet. So the prairie dog is important to those animals as a gardener. It's digging up all those seeds to have those nutrient native grasses come back. They could also be a landlord. So that means that they're gonna dig a burrow and another animal is gonna take it over, like the black-footed ferret or rabbits or burrowing owls so owls will burrow into so they don't actually dig they just take over that prairie dog burrow but another one we like to refer to the prairie dog as a meatball because there's a lot of species of animals in the park that eat the prairie dogs it's an important part of their diet so you can see a badger over here i don't see a photo of a coyote but i'll show you one and this black-footed ferret again so the ferret lives in a prairie dog burrow, but it also eats prairie dogs. We're gonna dive into that a little bit more. So kind of working with different relationships, this bison, so Wind Cave <clears throat> has a herd of about 350 bison that we protect. And you can see that the birds are all lined up on the bison's back, which looks kind of cool, kind of silly. But the birds are actually going after the insects that get embedded in that bison's fur. So we have another important relationship. It's keeping that bison safe. 
This is not uncommon for us to see along the prairie, especially in the early spring and summer. Um, so June, about June, uh, you can see that there's a little one in the photo. So we have a prairie dog calf. There's also a lot of cows. Those are the female bison. This is what we call a bull. It's a male bison. And they're very dark. They're the size of a In the spring, we call these red dogs because of their cinnamon color. So when the bison calves are born, it is deceiving because they are little, um, but they can still be a couple, couple hundred pounds, okay? So they're still pretty big. Um, but you can notice that the prairie grasses are really green. We get a lot of rain in the spring, which is important for the mothers because the calves will nurse. So you're also gonna notice that I said that the calves are born cinnamon. They tend to lose that about September, which is where we are right now. Um, but that there's snow and it's still cinnamon colored. That's because these animals have to be adapted to that extreme weather too. So bison get these really thick coats because they winter over. So they stay in the park um, and they will, like you see here, there's frost and there's snow all over that bison's very thick coat. Um, Native peoples used to use those bison furs for a variety of things whether it was for their teepees or whether it was actually for a coat for them to wear. Um, so bison are an important animal that we have, especially in the Great Plains. Wind Cave National Park is one of the last places that we protect a wild bison herd. There's a few other places around the country, um, but this is one of the last places. So bison in the spring, when they're shedding that really thick winter coat, they get really itchy. They have to shed it. So you see the bison scratch here. All right, so we've covered gardener. So the prairie dog is the gardener for the bison because all that grass is very important for the bison to eat. That's its main diet. What about a meatball? So this animal looks really cute and fuzzy, right? but it's actually a predator to the prairie dog. Now, it's also an animal that was once thought to be extinct, so completely gone from the face of the earth, until a family in Wyoming, their dog actually brought them one. They were a little confused, but as far as conservation goes, it was pretty exciting. So the National, nope, the Fish and Wildlife Service, that's also a national agency in the United States, um, started a breeding program for them so that they could train uh, what we call reintroduce, so bring them back into the wild. And it became very important for Wind Cave, but they're also what we call a vulnerable species because their main food source is prairie dogs. So what, again, prairie dog is our keystone species. So if the prairie dog disappears, so does the black-footed ferret. Okay, that's like an automatic, just like the yucca plant with the yucca moth, if one disappears, they both do. So our park managers here at Wayne Cave spend a lot of time tracking these guys. So they're actually microchipped um, and they do a lot to make sure that we are trying to keep them safe. And that means protecting the prairie dogs. So that's why they dust, our resource managers dust. So all of these different aspects of what a national park does they actually start to interconnect. So the prairie dog dusting, the protecting of the native grasses, is protecting other animals like the bison and the black-footed ferret. So part of that program, because the black-footed ferret was not actually found on the prairie um, in recent history. So it was once historically, but not recently. So they've actually released from that breeding program the black-footed ferret. So you're gonna notice, I call them slinky. They're really thin. They can get into those prairie dog burrows. Yeah. So prairie dogs eat grass. That's their main, their main food source. Um, Blackfoot, so prairie dogs are diurnal. They're awake during the day. Blackfooted ferrets are nocturnal 
and they're very thin that they can go into the prairie dog burrows to get those prairie dogs when they're sleeping. So they're pretty well adapted, I'd say, to being able to hunt those prairie dogs. So I'm gonna remind you what it looks like when a prairie dog's on alert, if I can find it. During the day, this is a common scene to see of the prairie dog. But at night when they're sleeping, they're not really having anybody out there, any of those prairie dog friends, to be on alert. So it makes it pretty easy for the black-footed ferret to get some of those prairie dogs. So another animal that we have on the prairie is called a badger. And badgers, while they can't necessarily get into the prairie dog burrow, they do make it bigger. Um, you can see the claws down here at the bottom. They have really good digging paws. Look at those pretty nice and long noses, right? So one of my other favorite relationships is between the badger and the coyote. So you're gonna notice the coyote is very well camouflaged, so it blends into its surroundings. Um, and it's not, in t it's not common, but it's also not uncommon, if that makes sense. Um, to see a badger and a coyote working together to go after prairie dogs. So pretty interesting to have two different species of animals working together to get their food, right? So the difference between a coyote going after anything. So coyotes are what we call an opportunistic feeder. So if it's roadkill, they will go after rabbits, they'll go after prairie dogs, they'll go after small rodents, um, anything to make sure their bellies are full. In contrast to the black-footed ferret that eats primarily prairie dogs. So which one do you think is better adapted? Which one do you think is gonna be more likely to survive if one species kind of died out? Probably the coyote. Um, I'm originally from a city, so Cleveland, Ohio, and it's not uncommon to see coyotes, unfortunately, along the highway. So opportunistic feeders, they're not gonna let themselves go hungry. They're gonna find the food that they need to eat. So it's pretty cool to see out on the prairie um, just the coyotes roaming around. Um, our population here is very healthy because again, uh, they're kind of our cleanup crew. So if cars drive through the park and they hit a prairie dog, I don't see it the next day. Coyotes are very efficient at finding free food, right? So we now have, this is the meatball. So the prairie dog is a meatball for the coyote and the black-footed ferret. Let's see. How about landlord? So these guys look really cool. Um, these are burrowing owls. And you can see here that you have the prairie dog and the burrowing owl in the same photo. Um, pretty neat. The burrowing owl does take over the prairie dog burrow. And they do go away for the winter and then they come back in the spring to have their young. So in that way, the prairie dog is the landlord. We also have... <clears throat> Do I have it? Prairie dog is a landlord for this little guy too. So we do have little rabbits that are out on the prairie that like to go in the prairie dog burrows. I already dug for them. Makes it very, very nice. Um, we also have elk. So this is one of our larger animals. Uh, bison and elk are going to be some of our larger wildlife here at Wing Cave. Um, it is. Is this reindeer? Reindeer? I don't know why I can't hear you. Did you have a question? Yes, sir. Is this a reindeer? What you have shown uh, before? You've seen that before? Yeah. Uh -oh. Can you type your question in the chat? Yes, yes. Is this a reindeer? Ah. Um, this is what we call an elk. So they are, they Fox. look similar to reindeer. Um, that's actually going to be in Alaska. So here, I'll show you real quick. I don't know if, I don't think it's on this map. Um, 
Alaska is up here. Um, it's called in a tundra, so it's a different ecosystem. Um, they do look similar. Uh, so sometimes if kids ask if it's a reindeer, we tell them yes, because um, they get really excited. Yeah, but they are different. It's a reindeer in India. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, that's information for me. Very cool. Um, I didn't know that. Awesome. So they are elk. Um, again, they are park park folks here um, do a lot to manage this population because uh, they do have a disease that's kind of taking them over. So we are actually doing what's called culling. It means that the park managers are actually killing part of the herd to see if that reduces the disease in animals because it's um, highly transmissible. So it goes from one elk to another pretty quickly. But also it's from the grasses. So when the animal dies, it goes into the ground and then the grass that the next elk eats is contains that disease. So they do a lot to try to um, control the population. So we've had a lot of producers and consumers. So that's kind of some new words. Producers are going to be like the prairie dog is producing the, you know, it's the, con um, for the consumer of the black-footed ferret and the coyote. But we also have um, what we call decomposers. So with this being a semi-arid climate, things aren't going to decompose as quickly as in a humid environment. Um, so we have, let's see here. Why do I keep losing it? There it is. This little guy. So insects are important to the prairie too. So I said we have a biodiverse prairie ecosystem. So it's not just about the big wildlife you see or the grasses or the pretty flowers. It's also about the insects that we have. So this is called a dung beetle. Uh, you can see it's rolling some of its dung. We also have, so that's a decomposer. Then we also have different fungi. So this is actually in, the, uh, in a buffalo patty, what we call that, um, that it's starting to decompose. We also have. Uh, we do have this insect of dung roller in yeah. India. Yeah, yeah. I have taken a shot in my camera in uh, uh, last few months. Oh, fun. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, we might have some similarities. They might be called some different things. But yeah. again, biodiverse isn't just one ecosystem, they're all yeah. over the world, right? So it's right, how. Right animals and plants and insects are going to work with the environment they're in. So I would I would challenge you in India where you live to see if there's an area that you can find that might be considered a biodiverse area. I bet you can find one. Yes, I, yes, yes. Yeah. So Wind Cave National Park protects all these really cool resources. Um, we have all this wildlife. So this is a porcupine behind me. They have very sharp quills. We protect pronghorn. Um, so resource managers and the park managers have to make sure that we're keeping a balanced ecosystem to keep this area biodiverse. And so it is important to protect those little tiny insects and the really big buffalo. Um, that. So again, if we come back to my arrowhead here, and I said the National Park Service is going to protect scenic places. So we protect the beautiful prairie. We protect different wildlife. Like the bison. We don't necessarily protect big trees, but those grasses are really important to this ecosystem. And we also protect the different stories of the people in this area. So do you guys have any questions for me? And it might be easier if you type them in the chat function. I had asked for you two questions here in the chat box. Uh, what these uh, prairie dogs feed on? The prairie dogs are gonna eat primarily grass. Grass, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And they live in a cave, I think. Cruiser. Uh, I don't know. Where do they? Where do these prairie dogs live? 
you know they make a hole in uh, earth i think yes so give me a second so this drawing shows you right, right, this right, is the right. prairie dog grill yeah. so they're actually going yeah. to dig um through through the earth so when they're digging that's when it's digging up the seeds also yeah um, so they do uh we often get the question um so we do have a cave in wind cave national park uh prairie dogs don't dig deep enough to get to the cave yeah we, we sometimes get that question um they only dig about 17 feet deep Yes, yes. We have we have mongoose like this the dog. We have mm -hmm. a mongoose in India. It also oh. uh, uh, digs such types of bruises and it lives uh, under the earth. And uh, the mongoose eat uh, snakes. Oh, so they're important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That sounds kind of like the black-footed ferret prairie dog relationship. So there are similarities, might be different species, but. Yeah, right, right, right. And my second question is that, uh, is this, uh, does this prairie dog have a frighten with the animals who, uh, who are carnivorous animals? Does it well with the animals? Carnivorous, uh, who eat ma meat of the, or a little okay. animals. Yeah, so the black-footed ferret and the coyotes are the um are the carnivores they eat the prairie dogs okay okay what is this what is this one this is the black-footed ferret yeah yeah um so they will their primary uh diet is okay. prairie dogs so prairie dogs only eat um only eat grass they might eat insects but then coyotes and black-footed ferrets only eat meat. Okay, okay. So they're carnivores. Do you have any other questions? No, thank you. You have given a lot of uh, information about uh, prairie and uh, just we have learned about the uh grassy lands throughout the world <laughs> a state yeah. prairie towns and uh, like this we india also have uh, in india also have we have a lot of uh, grassy lands where uh, this is called uh, as mudo mido yeah and uh, our cows and buffaloes are uh, used to uh, graze on these meadows and grassy lands yeah yeah Awesome. Oh, well, you have shown us the awesome information about prairie and uh, uh, life uh, on prairie and about the animal and plant species in prairie. Thanks uh, very much from my students on behalf of my students and me. We've got a lot of knowledge from you. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys have a good evening. Um, yeah. I'm just starting my day. so. I okay. hope you have a good evening and a good summer. Are you in summer now? No, we have a rainy season now. You have rainy season now. Gotcha. Apparently, I'm approaching snowy season because I'm looking out the window and it's snowing. Yeah. So. <laughs> awesome. This, well, I hope this, you guys this, have a this good is day. Biodiversity. Okay. Good day. Good night. We have a <laughs> night and good day for you. <laughs> Thank you. Good okay. night. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. नैसर्गिक प्रदेश शिकलो का शिकलो बन प्रेरी स्टेप डाउन गवता प्रदेश शिकलो अपन पैकी एक गवता प्रदेश प्रेरी इन्फॉर्मेशन होती गवता चे दाख होते ब गवताच रूट कि खाली जो कस दाखे बनी गवतावर रह गवता पर गुजरान करना जी जीविका ज्यादा चलते तशा प्रकार प्राणी तथा रहता है बाइसन अपने कड़े 
जे गायी असतात ना गायींसारखा स्पेसिस एक प्राणी आहे बायसन नावाचा तो तिथं असतो जो शाकाहारी आहे गवत गवत खातो त्यानंतर तो प्रेरी डॉग दाखवला बघा डॉग प्रेरी डॉग प्रेरी मध्ये राहतो त्या गवत प्रदेशात जो गवत खातो आणि त्या आपल्या आपल्याकडे मुंगूस असतो बघा तो कसं बिळत राहतो नाही का जमिनी खाली तसंच तो प्रेरी डॉग राहतो आहे की नाही आणि तिथं एक कोल्ह्यासारखा जाकल सारखा एक प्राणी दाखवला बघा तो त्याला खातो नंतर आपल्याकडे एक काळवीट असतं बघा शिंगांचं हॉर्न असतात त्याला तसं एक काळवीट दाखवलं त्याला त्यां ते तिकडे ओक म्हणतात आपण त्याला इकडे रेनडिअर म्हणत असतो आहे की नाही नंतर काही डिअर वगैरे दाखवले त्यांनी तर बऱ्याच प्रमाणे बऱ्याच जर विचार केला तर बऱ्याच अंशी साम्य आहे जगातल्या अशा वेगवेगळ्या प्रदेशांमध्ये थोडासा डिफरन्स आहे किंवा नावामध्ये थोडा फरक आहे तर छान सेशन झाले आणि तुम्ही बरेच जण जॉईन झालात फक्त एखाद दोन जर सोडले तर एकच जण कोणी नाहीये प्रथमेश पण नंतर नंतर जॉईन झाला आय थिंक हा फक्त कोमलनी ते जॉईन झाले नाहीत सगळे जण जॉईन झाले खूप छान वाटलं असे सेशन ठेवायचे आपण आठवड्याला आता आपला सिलेबस संपलेलाच आहे म्हणून आपण दिवाळीपर्यंत आता आपण आठवड्याला एक सेशन ठेवत जाऊ असं हा व्हर्च्युअल फिल्ड ट्रीप आज आपण प्रेरेला गेलो आता आपण दुसऱ्या नॅशनल पार्कला जाऊया ते सगळे असे आठ साडेआठ नऊच्या आसपास असतात आहे की नाही तर आता मी काय करतो आजच एक दुसरं रजिस्टर करून ठेवतो हा काही हरकत नाही छान आहे काही प्रॉब्लेम नाही ना तुम्हाला जॉईन व्हायला नाही 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 ठीक आहे चला गुड नाईट चला माझं जेवण बाकी आहे तुमचं झालं असतील गुड नाईट टेक केअर उद्या आपलं सेशन साडेआठ ला असेल उद्या सेशन साडेआठ ला बुधवार गुरुवार साडेआठ ला ठीक आहे चला बाय 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 गुड नाईट सर गुड नाईट बाय सर